Hi, and uh, today we're going to be going over mass movements, which is also called mass wasting depending what textbook you like to use. But basically mass movements or mass wasting are landslides. And uh, the technical definition of these is the large scale transfer of material downslope under the force of gravity. And I put gravity in yellow there because that's a really important thing to remember is that the ultimate cause of all mass movements is gravity. The earth trying to pull everything towards its center. Now there's things that can happen that make mass movements more likely to happen in some places than others, but ultimately gravity is at fault for all of these, right? Gravity all is, is the ultimate cause. So if I ask on the test, What's the ultimate cause of all mass movements? You better answer gravity. All right, that being said, I just told you there are things that can make mass movements more likely in some places than in others. There are things that can uh, make it easier for gravity to take hold. And that's what we're going to look at next, these factors that affect how stable a slope is. One thing is what we call over steepened slopes. And um, in, well, let's start with unconsolidated materials. Unconsolidated materials are things like sand or gravel or soil. It's stuff you could dig in with a shovel or, or your hands. It's not solid rock. And all unconsolidated materials have something called the angle of repose. The angle of repose is the steepest angle at which this unconsolidated material is stable. And what that angle is depends on the characteristics of the soil or the sand or so on, but they always have that angle of repose. And so, for instance, here, this stuff's being dumped out there and the material naturally slides to its angle of repose. So if we were to oversteepen this, we might come in here and scoop this stuff out, and that would be unstable. And then what would happen? Gravity would pull this stuff downwards to maintain that stable angle. Now we also can have uh, oversteepened slopes happen in, um, in bedrock or solid rock. And we can get undercutting occurring in this solid rock. This often happens naturally because of wave erosion at coastlines or maybe rivers as they flow next to uh, bedrock. People can also create undercutting. But here's a natural way undercutting can happen. We have uh, a cliff right here. We have the ocean here. And of course, waves are going to be acting on this. Waves are going to be hitting this cliff and they're slowly going to carve out this notch right there. And that means there's no support, right? That's undercut. There's nothing supporting this. So gravity can take over and pull this stuff downwards. And, uh, and there we go. We had this undercut slope, making it easier for gravity to act on that area. And right here, that's something similar. There's a, a stream that flows down here that's been carving away at this rock. We can see that rock is undercut. There's nothing supporting that. So that could very easily move. Um, now, other things, it's not just undercutting and, or over steepening slopes that can uh, affect slope stability. Also, adding mass high on a slope is by adding mass, you're, you're basically increasing the, the tug of gravity. Um, and we're going to visit a place in Scotland to see an example of adding mass high on a slope. This is a, a diagram of what Duffus Castle would have looked like uh, in the 1100s. And Dolphus Castle is a nice example of what we call a Mott and Bailey Castle. Uh, Mott is spelled M-O-T-T-E. Mott is this hill. That's an artificial hill. Basically, the lord of this place would have gotten his peasants to bring buckets and buckets of uh, sand and gravel and dirt and build up this hill. So that's the Mott. And then the Bailey is this area, this walled courtyard where like uh, livestock would be kept or the blacksmith would have a shop or the butcher would be and all of that good stuff. 
And um, these were very popular for a time because uh, being on this defensive hill, having their castle on the defensive hill, well, you know, it's, it's hard to run uphill, especially in armor, and you can have a better view of the land around. So it was a very good defensible castle. Now, early on, these castles on these Mott and Bailey structures were built from wood. But later on, it, um, uh, it became much more common or more popular to build your castles of stone. So later on, the lord of this area was like, I don't want a wooden castle anymore, I want a stone castle. Stone weighs a lot more than wood. So we're adding a lot of weight high on this slope. And then this happened. Notice this part of the castle should be up here, but it's basically slid down the side of that, uh, that mop, the side of that um, uh, artificial hill. And that actually did happen while people were uh, still living in that castle. They uh, moved out shortly thereafter. I do like to point this out as well. This, is, uh, this image is taken from inside the castle looking at this block. And uh, notice this little cubby hole right there and there's like a hole there. That's the bathroom. So imagine you were like sitting on, you know, in the bathroom when that happened. I don't know if that actually occurred, but that would have been interesting. But anyway, that's what happens when you add uh, weight high on a slope. You can uh, cause a mass movement. All right, another thing that can help gravity cause mass movements is if you have inherently weak materials. The inherently weak means just by the structure of the material it is likely to collapse or move. And a great example of these are these things we call quick clays. Um, quick clays, well first of all clay minerals have a shape like a playing card. They're really really thin and then kind of longer in the other dimensions and they're deposited out of water and they form this sort of house of cards structure where they're sort of sitting end on end on each other. And um, what can happen then is later on there can be a disturbance, something might just shake the area or maybe you get a heavy rainstorm, you get something happening that disturbs those quick clays and just like if you're building a house of cards, it's very unstable, like the cat sneezes in the other room and, it, and the thing collapses, well that's what happens with these. All those quick clays basically collapse and pack themselves closer together. And um, this is a place where quick clays collapsed and um, this is a road right here and this should look more like this area but these quick clays ended up collapsing there. The next picture is going to be taken from right about here on that road. And so there we're on that road, we're looking at this area, you can see there's like a shed and stuff built on that but uh, whatever disturbance occurred uh, allowed these quick clays to collapse and cause that. The good news for at least us here is that quick clays tend to be in places that used to be glaciated. So people in Alaska or Canada or Scandinavia have to worry more about these than we do. Another factor that affects the stability of a slope is water. Water does three main things. First of all, it adds weight. I said before that uh, every gallon of water weighs about eight pounds, actually a bit more than eight pounds. And um, in a rainstorm, you're probably going to get more than a gallon of water landing on an area. So we're going to be adding a lot of weight to that. In addition, water reduces cohesion. So I want you guys to think about going to the beach and building a sandcastle. You know, when you build a sandcastle, you want the, the, the sand to be damp. That makes it stick together, but if you put too much water in the bucket when you're making the sandcastle, the sand no longer sticks together and it just gets runny and flows everywhere. That's what I mean by reducing cohesion. Too much water reduces cohesion and allows things to flow. And then, also, water can reduce friction. 
This is why it's easier to spin out in your car on a rainy day because the friction is reduced between the road and your tires. Well, let's say you have layers of rock and some water gets into those layers of rock. That could reduce the friction enough to allow those rock layers to slide. And that could be what's happening here. We see a little bit of dark right there. That's some water right there. And that could ultimately reduce the friction between these two rock layers and allow this thing to slide downwards. Now, geologic structures can also affect um, your, um, uh, your slope stability. When layers are inclined parallel to a slope, they are more likely to move. So, for example, let's say we have a hill. Let's draw a nice hill on here. And let's say in this hill I have geologic layers that are inclined like this. So what's happening then, these layers, this layer right here, is going to be more likely to slide in that direction than in this direction. And that's because the layer is oriented parallel to the slope. So it's much easier for gravity to pull it that way than to pull it this way. So if we're looking at this, these layers are oriented, kind of dipping towards my husband's car, and so they would be likely to slide in that direction. Now, ultimately, all mass movements are caused by gravity. But usually there's a trigger, there's an event that kind of, you can think of it as the straw that broke the camel's back, the thing that pushes stuff just over the edge and allows gravity to take over. And in many cases, it could be a heavy rainstorm. Lots of mass movements happen after rainstorms. It could be an earthquake. Um, sometimes when frozen ground thaws, this can, uh, of course, there's going to be a lot more water then, and so as this frozen ground thaws, you can get a mass movement. And humans can also sometimes help cause mass movements to occur. Now, when we look in geology at these mass movements, we do classify them. We, we want to do this because different mass movements behave in different ways, and Different mass movements have kind of different hazard levels. Some are very deadly, whereas others, they're not deadly, but you need to be concerned about them because of where you might be building a property or building a road or so. And so we really want to know what different kinds of mass movements we have to deal with. So one thing we look at when we're classifying mass movements is we look at the type of material that's moving. Is it solid rock? Is it pieces of rock? Or is it this unconsolidated material like soil or regolith, basically sand and gravel and stuff like that? We also look at how is that material moving? Is it a fall? In a fall, it's a free-falling motion, meaning the material is not always touching the ground underneath it. Could be a slide. In a slide, the material is cohesive, and that means it stays stuck together. So whatever size and shape you begin with, it moves, and then it's still that size and shape at the end. And so this cohesive chunk moves on a well-defined surface. So it's not in the air or anything like that. It's always touching the ground under it. And that's what we see right here, right? If it looks like if I had, you know, the all-powerful hand, I could just push this stuff and it would come right back into place, right? It stays stuck together in these pieces. Or we might have a flow, and a flow moves as a fluid, and it's going to have this very chaotic, disordered, jumbled way of moving. It's not going to stay stuck together in one piece. Now the last thing we look at when we're classifying mass movements is we look at how fast they're traveling. Some things could be traveling in meters per second. Meters per second is uh, basically you can think miles per hour. 
Um, some might be as slow as millimeters per year. They might move this much in any given year. It's probably not going to kill you, but it could be damaging to roadways and other structures. So let's look at some of the mass movements that we have to deal with on Earth. You might have a rock fall, and hey, check it out. That's the type of material moving. That's how it moves. Right? So it's going to be rock that's falling. Can you have a soil fall? Well, yeah, but usually soil doesn't form steep enough slopes that you get that free falling motion. So it's usually going to be rock. So it's this rock, it's free falling, and this is common where we have steep or undercut slopes. So what we see here, we have this nice steep slope, there's this rock up there, and maybe frost wedging breaks it apart more, maybe we have a little earthquake, whatever happens, that rock falls and then it lands. That's our rock fall. Now, that's not going to be the only rock that's falling from there, right? It's not like, oh, one rock fell from this really steep slope. It's never going to happen again. It, it will happen again. So what happens over time, you have repeated rock falls over and over. You'll get this pile of broken up material at the base of that slope called talus. And that talus is uh, letting you know this is a place that has frequent rock falls. We see some of this talus right here. This is at uh, Lake Mead, right along the Nevada-Arizona border. We have this tan-colored rock, and then sitting above it, we have this black rock. And notice all of this debris of black rock that's all fallen off those cliffs. And so we would call these talus slopes. And right? it's all that broken up material that fell from there. If you go closer to a talus slope, you can see it's going to be made up of all kinds of different sizes and shapes of rocks. Some very, very big, some relatively small. And uh, where all of this came from, up here out of the photograph, there's a cliff. And these rocks are falling from that cliff and kind of bouncing down here and creating this talus slope. Oh. Now, um, if we had been able to take the hill country field trip, we would have gone to this location. And notice the house is there. I'm just going to let you know that's a very poor housing choice. You see all these big rocks down here? They come from up there, which means someday this is going down there. See this lady right here? She lives in one of those houses. I don't know which one, but I was standing there. I'm telling all my students about how that, those are poor housing choices because someday parts of them are going to start falling into the river. And she like marched over and she's like, I live in one of those houses and I love that house. And I was like, well, that's nice. Enjoy it while you have it. That just goes to show you how uh, thin the rock at that location is and how likely it is that one of these days it's going to collapse. I also want to point out that the spiral staircase hangs over the edge of the cliff, so definitely don't climb those stairs while you're drunk. Um, this is an oversteep and slope created by people. This is a road right here, and you can see we've undercut that, so this is a place where there's very likely to be a rock fall. But just like you shouldn't build uh, your house right at the top of the edge of a cliff, you probably shouldn't build your house at the bottom of the cliff either because those rocks are going somewhere. And where are they going? Possibly into your house. Fortunately, this homeowner was not in the blue chair when that rock fell there. All right, so those are rock falls, but we also have the type of mass movement called slides. And there are two basic types of slides that occur. We can have what's called a translational slide. A translational slide is usually rock, and you're going to have movement on a planar surface. Planar doesn't mean horizontal. Planar just means flat. Right? It doesn't have any curves or anything. It's a flat surface. This is different from a rotational slide. Now, rotational slides are also in some books called slumps. S-L-U-M-P, a slump. I prefer the term rotational slide, um, mainly because it really describes how the movement is. Because these move along a curved surface, so the material actually does rotate. And in this case, usually it's going to be soil or regolith. 
unconsolidated material that moves. Here we have a nice little diagram showing you the difference between those. Here we have our translational slide. Remember in slides the material stays cohesive. So originally it was up here and it slid along this surface to a new location. Same thing here. This is our rotational slide. This stayed cohesive, stuck together, but it moved along that curved surface. So this, if one of these rocks ended up moving, normally I'd be asking you what kind of, uh, what kind of slide would this be, translational or rotational? And you guys being the most amazing students in the universe, every single one of you would be saying that's going to be a translational slide because it's rock and it's moving on a planar surface. And I'd be like, yes, I have the best students in the universe. All right, just to show you how things do stay cohesive, um, this is a road in New Zealand. I was supposed to be going to work, didn't get to work that day. But anyway, um, this slide came from over here and it slid into place there. And I keep saying these things are cohesive, they stay stuck together. This say stayed so stuck together the tree is still growing in there. Um, so it definitely didn't break apart in any way. This is a real life rotational slide. There's another one of our cars. Uh, this material here started out, out up here. And this photo was taken about seven years after this rotational slide happened. But all of this should kind of rotate up into that location. All right, so those are the two basic types of slides that we can have. We can also have flows. Remember, flows are where we have that very chaotic movement, right? The, so the material moves as a fluid. And a very common type of flow is called a debris flow. Debris flows often follow stream channels. Not always, you can have hill slope debris flows, but they often follow stream channels and um, they usually follow heavy rains because your material has to be saturated, right? It has to be and saturated means whatever's moving is 100% completely filled with water. Um, so we have the saturated material moves chaotically down slope. You will sometimes hear things called a mud flow. A mud flow is if only fine grained material is involved. So if it's only like silt and clay and maybe some sand, it's a mud flow. But if it's boulders and rocks and all kinds of stuff, all different shapes and sizes, we call it the debris flow. These things can be very fast. They can move meters per second, which can make some of these very, very deadly. So this is a debris flow on a hill slope. Like I said, that can happen, but most debris flows are going to be channelized. They're going to be following river channels. And a great example of a debris flow that happened was a Slumgullion debris flow. This occurred about 700 years ago in Colorado. If we look at this mountain here, definitely looks like something happened because that part of the mountain looks very different from here. Well, that part of the mountain was made of a lot of like volcanic ash and some sedimentary material. There must have been some heavy rains back 700 years ago and this ended up, this whole mountainside basically collapsed into a debris flow. So that mountainside was right there and if you look right here, that's the debris flow following an old stream channel down this way. If we look closely at the surface of that debris flow, it has what's called a hummocky topography. That means a very irregular surface to it. And this is called the toe of the debris flow. That's the end of it. Now in this case, this debris flow flowed into the uh, San Cristobal River Valley and it actually dammed the river and created San Cristobal Lake, which is the second largest natural lake in Colorado. So if we look at this whole thing, that's where the debris flow began, there's the pathway of it, and then here's where it ended in that river valley. And uh, like I said, that was about 700 years ago that the Slumgullion debris flow occurred, somewhere between 700 and 800 years ago. And um, the interesting thing though about debris flows is that um, after 
after they... Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm running out of time. <laughs>